Hi everyone, it's Professor Permanton, and today we're going to finish up our discussion on one-to-one -one functions and their inverses. So in the previous video, we talked about what is the definition of a one-to-one -one function, and we also talked about how to verify whether two functions are actually inverses of one another using composition, and also the domain and range of an inverse function, and how it relates back to the domain and range of the original function. In this video, we're going to talk about how to find and evaluate the inverse of a function, and also to use the graph of a one-to-one -one function to graph its inverse function. So let's talk about how to find the inverse of a function. We're going to examine how to compute inverse functions. So in the previous video, we talked about one-to-one -one functions are exactly those functions that actually have an inverse. So if we have an inverse function, the definition of an inverse function was f inverse of y meant y was the output whenever you input x into the function f. And so the inverse function sent y back to x. We're going to find out if you solve this equation for x in terms of y, then we're going to have this equation where x has been solved for, and what's left over is going to be an equation that involves y, and that's going to turn out to be the inverse function. So here's how we're going to do that. We're going to interchange the variables x and y so that we get the inverse function, y equals the inverse of x. So the input variable is still going to be x for the inverse function, and the output will be y. So the theorem says, finding the inverse of the one-to-one -one function, so if you have a one-to-one -one function, it will have an inverse. So step one is to replace the function notation, the f of x, with a y. So that way you only have variables x and y to deal with in the equation. So step two, this is the important step that actually makes inverse functions possible if a function does have an inverse, is that you interchange the variables x and y. So x is now going to be the output variable, and y is now going to be the input variable for your inverse function. So now step three, solve the resulting equation for y. So notice, if you interchange the variables x and y, the equation is no longer solved for y. It's not going to be y equals a function of x. It'll be x equals a function of y. And so if you solve that equation for y, then you're going to get the inverse function. If the equation does not define y as a function of x after you solve for y, then the inverse doesn't exist. And so the procedure ends. If this equation does define y as a function of x after you get y by itself after interchanging x and y, then you have the inverse function of f of x. And then step four, keep in mind, you can always check your answer just like we did in the previous video. If you do composition of the function and its inverse, you should always get what the variable you input back. So if you input y into your inverse function first, and then if you substitute that value into the function f, then you'll get y back. So if you input y after composition of f and its inverse, you also still get y, or the other way around. If f inverse is the outside function, and f of x is the inside function, if you input x into the function f, you get that output value, and then the output value goes into the inverse, you should still get just x. So you input x, and you output x after the composition of the function and its inverse. So let's go through these four steps from the theorem to actually find the inverse function, if one exists. So example four, finding the inverse function. Find the inverse function for the following one-to-one -one functions, so that way we actually can find the inverse. Then determine the domain and range of both the function and its inverse. So number one, the function is f of x equals negative 2x plus 5. Now notice that's a linear function because x is raised to the first power. We're going to find out, does this linear function have an inverse function? And what is it? So f of x, we're going to make it negative 2x plus 5. Replace the f of x with a y. That way we're only dealing with variables x and y. So now take the equation and now interchange your x variable with the y variable. And so interchange variables x and y gives you x equals negative 2y plus 5. So the y became an x and the x variable became a y. And so now, if this equation can be solved for y, it will give you an equation that gives you the inverse. So let's get y by itself. You have negative 2y is equal to x to track 5 after you move the 5 to the left side of the equation, and then divide both sides by negative 2, and so you have y is equal to x to track 5 divided by negative 2. Or if you simplify this in terms of two different fractions, you'll have y is equal to negative 1 half because the number in front of the x is a 1, so 1 divided by negative 2 will make it negative half. Keep the x. And then the other fraction is negative 5 divided by negative 2. That's positive 5 halves. And so this is an equation that's been solved for y. You have y equals negative 1 half x plus 5 halves. That is the inverse function. It has a unique formula. And so the inverse function of x is negative 1 half x plus 5 halves. So it's also a linear function because you have x to the first power. So now let's talk about the domain and range of both the function f of x and the inverse function f inverse of x. So the linear function we've talked about before you can input any x value that you want. You're never divided by zero whenever you input the x value, and you're never taking the even root of a negative number. So the domain of f of x is negative infinity to infinity, and we talked about this in the previous video, that there's a relationship between the domain of f of x and the range of the inverse function. They're actually the same. 
So the domain of f of x is negative infinity to infinity. That's the range of the inverse function as well. And so now let's find out the domain of the inverse function. So the inverse function is also a linear function. If you input any x value, you'll never divide by 0. And if you input any x value, you'll never have the even root of a negative number. And so the domain of the inverse function is also negative infinity to infinity. And again, from the last video, we talked about the domain of the inverse function is also equal to the range of the original function f of x. So the range of the original function is also negative infinity to infinity, or the set of all real numbers. So let's try number two. This time the function is f of x is 2x plus 3 in the numerator, all divided by x minus 1 in the denominator. So this function is what's called a rational function because it's a fraction of two different functions. And so a linear function is in the numerator, 2x plus 3, and it's being divided by another linear function, x minus 1. That's a rational function. So let's go through the same four steps to find out the inverse function of this function f of x. So f of x is 2x plus 3 over x minus 1. First step is to replace f of x with the variable y. So that way we only have variables x and y to deal with, not function notation. Now interchange the variables x and y. So this y becomes an x. And then any time you have an x, now that becomes a y. So you have 2y plus 3 in the numerator, and you have y subtract 1 in the denominator. So now if we can get this equation solved for y, then we'll have the inverse function's formula. And so notice, if you want to be able to clear the denominators, the LCD is y subtract 1. So the least common denominator is y minus 1. And so you multiply both sides of the equation by y minus 1 to clear the denominators. So x times y minus 1 on the left side of the equation is equal to 2y plus 3 on the right side divided by y minus 1 times y minus 1. That's the LCD. And so the y minus 1s will cancel out on the right side of the equation. And so you have x times y minus 1 is equal to the numerator 2y plus 3. So now distribute to remove any parentheses x times y minus x times 1, so minus x, so xy minus x is equal to 2y plus 3. And so if we're solving for the variable y, we need all the y terms on the same side of the equation. So we have an xy on the left side of the equation, but we have a 2y on the right side of the equation. Let's move the 2y to the left side of the equation to get all the y terms on the same side. So we have xy subtract 2y on the left side of the equation. All the other terms need to be on the opposite side, away from the y terms. So this minus x needs to be added to the right side of the equation to get x plus 3. And so now why do we get all the y terms on the same side of the equation? Because now it's in common and we can factor it out as the greatest common factor or GCF. So if the y is in common, factor it out. And so you have an x subtract 2 left over after you factor out the y. And the right side of the equation just stays x plus 3. And now if we want to get y by itself, we have y times x minus 2. Divide both sides of the equation by x subtract 2 and you'll have y by itself. y is equal to x plus 3 all divided by x minus 2. And so this is the inverse function of the function f of x. So if f of x is 2x plus 3 divided by x minus 1. The inverse function of f of x is not the reciprocal of 2x plus 3 divided by x minus 1. It actually turned out to be the inverse function is x plus 3 all divided by x minus 2 in the denominator. And so now let's talk about the domain and range of both f of x and the inverse function. So the domain of f of x, well, it was a rational function. We do have to worry about division by 0 in this case. So notice that the denominator cannot be equal to 0. So x minus 1 cannot be 0 tells you that x cannot be 1 for the function f of x. And so the domain of f of x is negative infinity to 1 and 1 to infinity. That's the only x value that cannot be substituted into the function f of x because that would result in an undefined y value. It doesn't exist. So that's also the range of the inverse function like we talked about in the last problem. So now let's find out the domain of the inverse function. The inverse function was x plus 3 all divided by x minus 2. Well, x minus 2 is then the denominator. That tells us that x minus 2 cannot be 0 because otherwise it will be divided by 0. And so x cannot be equal to 2. And so the domain of the inverse function is the set of all real numbers except for x equals 2 or using interval notation, negative infinity to 2 and 2 to infinity, which we also know is the range of the original function f of x. Number three, let's talk about this function f of x is equal to the square root of 5 plus 8x. This is what's called a radical function because it's involving a root, so a square root. So the function f of x is the square root of 5 plus 8x, which if we replace the f of x with a y, if we want to find the inverse function, only have variables x and y. So you have y is equal to the square root of 5 plus 8x, where the 5 plus 8x is inside the square root. Let's find out the inverse function by first interchanging the x's and y's. So the y becomes an x variable, and the x that's inside the root will become a y. And so now you have the equation x is equal to the square root of 5 plus 8y. And so now we need to get y by itself, but y is inside the square root function. So how do you get rid of the square root so that you can have the y by itself? Well, you need to undo the square root by squaring both sides of the equation. So square the left side of the equation. That'll make it x squared. But then also square the right side of the equation. And so you'll have the square root of 5 plus 8y, and that is all squared. 
So now the square root and the square, they're inverses of one another, so they'll cancel out or simplify to be 5 plus 8y on the right side of the equation, and the left side of the equation is just x squared. So now let's try to get y by itself, now that we don't have a square root involved. And so now if you subtract 5 on the left side of the equation, you'll have x squared minus 5 on one side of the equation, and the other side of the equation is 8y, and then divide both sides of the equation by 8. So y is equal to x squared minus 5, all divided by 8. And so you'll have y is equal to 1 eighth x squared, subtract 5 eighths. That is the inverse function because we have solved for y. So the inverse function, f inverse of x, is 1 eighth x squared, subtract 5 eighths, or if you want to keep it as one fraction, the inverse function would be x squared minus 5, all divided by 8. So there's one little thing you have to be careful about with this inverse function. The x values must be greater than or equal to 0. And that's because we square both sides of the equation that's going to introduce this restriction on x. And we're going to see why that's true in a second. So let's talk about the domain and range of both functions, f of x and the inverse function. So let's talk about the domain of f of x. Well, we have a square root involved. It's an even root. So what's inside the even root must be greater than or equal to 0. It must be 0 or a positive number only. So 5 plus 8x must be greater than or equal to 0. And if you get x by itself by solving the inequality, subtract both sides by 5. So you have 8x is greater than or equal to negative 5. And then divide both sides by positive 8. So you do not flip the inequality. You only reverse the inequality when you divide by a negative number or multiply by a negative number. We're divided by positive 8, so it stays the same direction. x is greater than or equal to negative 5 eighths. And so the interval notation for the domain for this function f of x is square bracket because negative 5 eighths is included in the domain. So square bracket negative 5 eighths to infinity. So any real number that's greater than negative 5 eighths is okay for the function f of x, which is also the range of the inverse function, like we talked about before. So let's talk about the range of f of x next. So you have to keep in mind that the function f of x was a square root of 5 plus 8x. When you input any x value into this square root, the smallest output value that you can have for this square root would be y equals 0. So the range of f of x, the y values must be greater than or equal to 0. Or the range of the function would be 0 to infinity, including 0. And so now we have a relationship between the range of f of x and the domain of the inverse function. Well, the domain of the inverse function is exactly the same set of real numbers. It must be a positive number or equal to 0, so 0 to infinity. So you can only plug in x values into your inverse function that are greater than or equal to 0 because the range of f of x was the y values must be greater than or equal to 0 from talking about the output values of f of x. So this is what's called a restriction of the domain. So the inverse function will only exist not for the set of all real numbers, but only for the set of real numbers where x is greater than or equal to 0. So this is what's called a restriction. We're restricting the domain to be, it must be a positive number for x, or x equals 0. Otherwise, we've talked about this before, that this function for the inverse is a quadratic function, because the highest power on x is 2. We know that if we look at the graph of the entire function, then it would not pass the horizontal line test. It would not be a one-to-one -one function. So we need to restrict the domain to be only talking about x's that are positive values, or equal to 0. And so it will pass the horizontal line test if we only graph the right side of the parabola. So let's try one more. Number 4, f of x is the function, the quantity x to the 5th subtract 6, all to the 7th. So this is what's called a power function, or a polynomial. If you multiply this function out, it actually will give you a polynomial function, which we'll talk about in the next chapter. So f of x is equal to the quantity x to the 5th subtract 6, all to the 7th. Let's take the f of x, the function notation, and replace it with the variable y, the output variable. And so now if we want to find the inverse function, we want to interchange the variables x and y again. So the y becomes an x, and inside the parentheses, the x to the fifth will become y to the fifth. And so you'll have x is equal to the quantity y to the fifth, subtract 6, all to the seventh. But now we want to get y by itself, and y is inside the parentheses, and the parentheses is being raised to the seventh. So how do we undo a parentheses that's being raised to the seventh power? Well, we want to take the seventh root to undo that exponent. So take the seventh root on both sides of the equation. So you have the seventh root of x is equal to the seventh root of y to the fifth minus 6 raised to the seventh. Well, the seventh root and the seven exponent will actually be inverses of one another. So they'll cancel out or simplify to y to the fifth minus 6 on the right side of the equation. And on the left side of the equation, you have the seventh root of x. And so now we need to get y by itself. We have y to the fifth minus 6. We need to add 6 to the left side of the equation. So we'll have y to the fifth is on one side of the equation. And on the other side of the equation, you'll have the seventh root of x and then add 6. And so now we don't want y to the fifth, we want y by itself. If we can get that by itself, we have the inverse function.
So if y is being raised to the fifth power, we want to undo that exponent. So we need to take the fifth root on both sides of the equation. And so the fifth root on the left side of the equation, so fifth root of y to the fifth, is equal to the fifth root of the seventh root of x plus six. So notice that the seventh root of x plus six is all inside the fifth root. And so we have on the left side of the equation, the fifth root of y to the fifth is just y. And so on the right side of the equation is the inverse function, the fifth root of the seventh root of x plus six. And so the inverse function is the fifth root of the seventh root of x plus six. And that does not simplify any further because there are two terms being added inside the fifth root. So now let's talk about again the domain and range of both f of x and the inverse function. So f of x was a polynomial function or a power function. There are no division by zero possible and there are no even roots of a negative number possible. So the domain for the function f of x is the set of all real numbers, negative infinity to infinity which again is also the range of the inverse function. Well now the domain of the inverse function knows that we have an odd root. It's the fifth root of the seventh root of x plus six. So we have two different odd roots. We have a fifth root on the outside and a seventh root on the inside. We don't have to worry about even roots of negative numbers and also we don't have any division by zero possible. So the domain of the inverse function is also the set of all real numbers or negative infinity to infinity, which again is also the range of the original function f of x. So let's finish up our discussion on inverse functions by graphing the inverse of a function. So the idea of interchanging the variables x and y to find the inverse function actually gives us a method to obtain the graph of the inverse function, f inverse of x, from the graph of f of x. So let's say you have the graph of f of x. How do you graph its inverse? If you don't have an explicit formula for the inverse function, how do you graph it? Well, there is a way to actually graph the inverse from the function f of x. So let's say we have a point a comma b. It's a point on the graph of y equals f of x, and f of x is a one-to-one -one function, so that the inverse function does exist. So if y is equal to f of x, that means if you input x equals a, you output y equals b. So f of a is equal to b. This is a point on the graph of f of x. And now if we interchange the x and the y to find the inverse function, that means that the inverse function of b will give you a. So a is equal to the inverse function of f evaluated at b. And so that means this gives us a point that's actually on the graph of the inverse function. If you input b into your inverse function, the output is a. So notice if a comma b was on y equals f of x, b comma a is a point on the inverse function's graph. And so now if you repeat this concept for every single point on the graph of y equals f of x, you actually get a relationship between the graph of its inverse and the original graph. The graph of the inverse function is obtained by reflecting the graph of y equals f of x about the line y equals x. So y equals x is like a symmetry line between the graph of y equals f of x and y equals the inverse of f. And so if we have this point a comma b, that's a point on the graph of y equals f of x. Its reflection across the line y equals x is this point b comma a, which will be on the graph of the inverse function. And so if you do that, that is what's called a reflection across the line y equals x y equals x is the symmetry line. So again, if we have the point b comma a is a point on the inverse function, that means the inverse function of b is equal to a. So if you input b, you output a. And so b comma a is a point on the inverse function. And if you have its reflection, that's on the graph of y equals f of x. So a reflection across the line y equals x, that's the original graph y equals f of x. And so a comma b means you input a into your function f, you output b. If you do that for every single point on the graph of the function f of x, you'll get the graph of the inverse function. And so notice that these two graphs are reflections across the line y equals x. So let's talk about this last example, example five, restriction of the domain. Use the graph of f of x, which is equal to the square root of x minus two, to sketch a graph of its inverse function, f inverse of x, then determine an equation for the inverse function. So let's talk about how to find the inverse function first. So the f of x is equal to the square root of x minus two, so if we take the f of x and make it a y, we'll have y is equal to the square root of x minus 2. We interchange the variables x and y so we can find this inverse function. We'll have x on the left side of the equation after we interchange x and y. And inside the square root, we'll have y minus 2. And so now we want to get y by itself. So solve this equation for y. So now take this equation and square both sides so that you'll have x squared on the left side. And then we want to square the right side because we want to undo the square root because y is inside the square root. So the square root of y minus 2, all squared. And so the left side of the equation is x squared, but then the right side of the equation will simplify to be y minus two, and we wanna get y by itself, so now add two to both sides of the equation, and so you have y is equal to x squared plus two. And so that is the inverse function.
the inverse function is f inverse of x, which is equal to x squared plus 2. But again, there's a restriction on the domain. It must be that x values must be greater than or equal to 0. Okay, now here's why. So notice that the graph of f of x, which is equal to the square root of x minus 2, that's this graph that's in blue. So the graph will start whenever x is equal to 2, because when you plug in 2, you'll get f of 2 is equal to the square root of 2 minus 2, that's 0. So the graph will start on the x-axis at 2 comma 0, so that's an x-intercept. If you plug in x equals 3, you'll get square root of 1, that's 1. And if you plug in x equals 6, you'll get the square root of 4, which is 2. So the graph of f of x will pass through these three points as you go to the right. And so the domain of f of x is where you have what's inside the square root must be greater than or equal to 2. It looks like from the graph that x must be greater than or equal to 2, so you only have the graph defined for x values on the right side of x equals 2. So that would be 2 to infinity, including 2 with a square bracket which means that the domain of f of x is also the range of the inverse function. So the inverse function's range is also 2 to infinity, including 2. Now let's talk about the range of f of x. Notice from the graph that the range of f of x looks like the graph will go no lower than the x-axis. So that's when y is equal to 0. And it looks like the graph goes up as you go to the right. So the y values will only be positive for this graph of f of x. And so the range of f of x is y values must be greater than or equal to 0. Well, the range of f of x would be bracket on 0, because 0 is included, to infinity. The range of f of x is also the domain of the inverse function. So the inverse function's domain is 0 to infinity, including 0. So that's why we have x must be greater than or equal to 0 for the inverse function, because that's its domain. We only have x values that are equal to 0 or positive allowed for the domain of the inverse function, because that's the range of f of x. And so now the last thing we need to talk about, how do you graph the inverse function? Well, if 2 comma 0 is a point on y equals f of x, then 0 comma 2 is a point on the graph of the inverse function. So an x-intercept for f of x is now becoming a y-intercept, 0 comma 2, for the inverse function's graph. If 3 comma 1 is a point on f of x, then 1 comma 3 is a point on the inverse function, because the x's and the y's have swapped roles. The input value x equals 3 is now an output value for the inverse, and the output value y equals 1 is now an input value for the inverse. And same thing for 6 comma 2. If you have 6 comma 2 on the graph of y equals f of x, that means that 2 comma 6 is a point on its inverse function. And so the inverse function's graph must start at 0 comma 2, just like the graph started at 2 comma 0 for the original function y equals f of x. The inverse function will start at 0 comma 2 on the y-axis, and the graph will go up as you go to the right, passing through 1 comma 3 and also 2 comma 6, and so on. Notice that these two graphs, the original graph, y equals f of x, and the graph of the inverse function, they look like they're symmetric with respect to this line, y equals x. So this finishes our video on how to find the inverse function of a one-to-one -one function, and also how to graph the inverse of a function. If you have any questions about any of the examples in this video, please let me know. Or if you have any questions while you work on homework for this section, please let me know that as well. And I'll see you at the next video when we talk about quadratic functions and their graphs.